Well, welcome to another Harry's Garage video. And in this video, we're talking about my 981 Porsche Boxster. Actually, I'm not Harry Metcalf, obviously. I'm Peter and I'm Australian, but we are gonna be talking about my one year review of my 981 Porsche Boxster base model. Actually, it's taken me 17 months to get around to this. So consider this an 18 month review. Now I do have a lot to cover here. So I hope you'll forgive me if I use these notes. There's a lot of stuff to get through and uh, I wanna make this as simple and as seamless as possible. Okay, so let's look first at the spec of this car. It's a 2013 981 Boxster base model with a 2.7 flat six in it, uh, but it comes with a few options which have made it a little bit tastier than your average 981. And they are, you can see here, the beautiful 20 inch Carrera Classic wheels. But importantly, it comes with uh, Sport Chrono. So that means you've got the Sport button, Sport Plus. It comes with a Sports exhaust, which gives it a beautiful sound when you hit the button. It's got some color coding on it. You can see just on the front here, the little, uh, the white fins on the front, plus the rollover hoops behind the seats are color coded white. And it's got park sensors. I think that's about it in terms of the options on this car, but it does make it a little bit tastier than your average 981 base. Okay, so why did I buy it? Well, I've been working full-time for about 40 years and I've been broke twice in that time. I've worked extremely hard, often for 24 hour stints at a time and I just wanted to do something that I'd always wanted. And you know, I, I just want to live while I'm alive. I figure that life is short, you never know when it's over, it could end at any moment. Uh, at my age, I'm 55, you start seeing people dropping off the perch all the time and you just know that it could be you any old time. So I wanted to spoil myself a little bit and this is how I've done it. Okay, now for the purchase details. Um, I bought it in October 2022. I paid $84,500 for it, Australian dollars. Uh, I paid cash for it by selling 35 items that I own, which included my gorgeous ND MX-5, which I had four years of motoring heaven with. I love that car. Uh, sold my motorbike, my golf clubs, some camera gear, a whole bunch of stuff, right down to items costing $100, $150 until I could pay cash for this thing. I didn't want to take any money out of our bank account. Uh, I wanted the money to come from things that I already owned so that I could own this car guilt-free and that's what I've done. Uh, when I bought it, it had 73,000 kilometres on the clock, which is about 45,000 miles. It now has 88,000 kilometres on it, which is about 54,000 miles and they've all been very, very enjoyable. I bought it from an independent dealer uh, that has a 40 year history selling cars here in Victoria. The impression that I got from them from the moment I spoke to them was that they were honest, ethical, straightforward, and uh, lovely to deal with. And that proved true when the car had its pre-purchase inspection, a couple of issues were uncovered and they did not hesitate to rectify those, even though one of them was probably quite costly. And I'll get to that in a minute. So as I mentioned, I had a pre-purchase inspection that was uh, 12 pages with images that cost me 412 Australian dollars, well worth it because they did pick up a couple of things which uh, needed to be rectified. And as I said, the dealer paid for those, which was great. It only came with the three month statutory warranty. There's no factory warranty left on this car, but uh, given the reliability of the 981, I was fine with that. If it had been an early 987 or a 986, then definitely I'd be a bit more concerned, but then getting a factory warranty on that would be nigh on impossible anyway. There's more details about this car and why I bought it and how I paid for it uh, in a couple of other videos that I've made, and I'll leave links for those in the description down below. Just go and look for those. Okay, so what's gone wrong with it and what have I had to fix? Well, as I mentioned during the pre-purchase inspection, a couple of things were uncovered. One of those, the most expensive one, was that the um, heating, ventilation, and aircon control blower was constantly on couldn't be turned off, so the dealership replaced the whole lower section of the uh, HVAC controls inside the cabin, which I imagine wouldn't have been cheap, even secondhand. Since taking delivery of the car, it's also needed a battery. This was uncovered when it had its first uh, service at Porsche Melbourne. It was not delivering enough voltage. They quoted, I think it was close to $1,000 to replace that battery. I did it for um, quite a lot less than that, and I'm gonna cover that along with all the other things that I have done to the car where I've spent substantially less than what Porsche quoted to do it. The alarm module packed up. Uh, that was um, an issue where I would lock the car and it would beep an extra one or two times. It was sort of beep, beep, I think it was after I locked it. And often I would come back to the car 
and the hazard lights would be flashing, suggesting that the alarm had gone off even though it hadn't. Uh, that's an alarm module problem, apparently it's quite common with them, and that was replaced when I was vulnerable at the dealership getting something else done for the uh, cost of 773 Australian dollars. That was done at Porsche Melbourne. Look, it's not too bad, I figure, but um, I probably could have gotten it cheaper if I wasn't sitting there with the car already being worked on and, um, and was sipping their lovely lattes there in their waiting lounge and wasn't so vulnerable. Back to those headlights, I also tried getting them polished by a detail at my house when it had his first round of paint correction. He tried for a long time to get all of those out. He did improve them somewhat, but those crazed headlights with all the internal cracks and everything can't be resolved by polishing because they exist inside the lens. Um, I also searched for replacement units but they're absolutely drug money. I considered replacing the outer lenses, but that is virtually impossible without using a Dremel and risking butchering your headlights because the glue that binds those lenses on uh, can't be removed until they get heated to something like 600 degrees Celsius, which is crazy. So that was, um, that was not a solution, but I did end up solving the problem and I'll get to that a little bit later on. Okay, service costs. Soon after I bought the car, I wanted to have the transmission serviced uh, as an act of precaution. Uh, the only thing I was really concerned about with this car was the PDK potentially packing up because they can't be repaired yet, as far as I know. Uh, and a replacement unit is something like 25,000 Australian dollars. And uh, they have to be sent back to Germany for analysis because apparently it is so rare that anything goes wrong with the PDK. But if it does, um, it'll be because there were uh, bits of metal filings or shavings inside the transmission fluid. So I wanted to flush that out, put in new fluid just as a precautionary measure, even though it wasn't due to <clears throat> have the fluid change until something like 120,000 kilometers. I just wanted to be sure. So I did that transmission fluid and I decided to do the drive belt at the same time. Um, and I think it was also differential oil at the same time. And that was 1200 Australian dollars at the local Porsche dealership in Melbourne. Its first annual service was only $695 which to my mind is very good value for a Porsche at a Porsche dealership that was done at uh, Porsche Melbourne. While it was there, they noted that the rear disc brakes were on the way out. Now I already knew this from the pre-purchase inspection as well when I bought the car and they quoted something like $1,500. Well, it was about $3,700 to do all four, but only the rears really needed to be done soon and that was around about $1,500. I got that done for significantly less elsewhere and I'll get to that in a minute when we get to the savings that I've made. So I didn't get that done at Porsche Melbourne. Uh, the wiper blades, $188 at Porsche Melbourne, that was nothing. I replaced the tyres, Pirelli P0 N1 tyres. The N1 tyres are designed specifically for the Porsche. The only other tyres really suitable for this uh, in my book are the um, Michelin Pilot Sport 4. Had difficulty getting those at the time, so went with the factory fitted uh, Pirelli P0s and again got them for quite a lot less than what Porsche quoted by going directly to a supplier and having a installer come to the house and fit them there in front of me which was which was a good experience actually. Okay so my maintenance total in the 17 months I've had the car including the tyres has been four and a half thousand dollars. Now if I take out the unnecessary but precautionary transmission and drive belt service, um, which was $1,200, like I mentioned, then we're down to $3,300. If you want to leave out the tires, which didn't need to be replaced yet, but there was a special on with Pirelli, so I thought, all right, I'll grab them now while I can. Um, if, if you take those out, because it probably still wouldn't be due tires now even, then we're talking $1,400. So really, basic maintenance for the car over the last 17 months has only been $1,400, which is pretty damn good. All right, now let's look at how I've saved money over the course of my 17 odd months of ownership of this car. And I think this is one of the things that are gonna interest you the most. When you own a luxury or prestige car of any description, even if you get the car nice and cheap pre-owned, the cost of parts and labor from an authorized dealership uh, doesn't get any cheaper. It's still the same as if you had bought the car from them new. So if you want to save money after you've saved money buying the car cheap, then you want to look at uh, specialist aftermarket suppliers, non-franchise um, uh, workshops, and um, third party suppliers of OEM parts, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll give you some examples here of what I did. So. As I mentioned the brakes, Porsche quoted about $1,500 to do the rear discs, pads and sensors. I actually bought Porsche OEM discs, pads and sensors online and had them fitted by a brake specialist for the grand total of $550 versus $1,500 supplied and fitted from Porsche. I got the tires from a reputable independent retailer and I had them fitted 
at my house in front of me by a fitting specialist for 1,876 Australian dollars versus three and a half thousand dollars quoted by Porsche. The battery, Porsche quoted me about a thousand dollars. I had that, I bought that from a battery specialist for $260, fitted it myself in about 10 minutes. Now, something else I did to the car, which you might've noticed in some of the recent videos is I lowered it a little bit and I did it the cheap ass way and I'm kind of regretting that now. I put on iBark lowering springs with the existing shocks and I don't think it's such a good idea. <laughs> I'm thinking now that I really need to put either Olin's or KW suspension coilovers on it if I want that slightly lowered look, but still have a decent ride. But anyway, in terms of that, um, that little job, the, um, I went to a suspension specialist, which I've used for many, many years for, for multiple cars. They do a fantastic job. They've been around for 35 odd years. They uh, fitted the uh, iBark lowering springs for $770 versus the $2,500 I was quoted by um, Porsche dealership. Okay, now we get on to the headlights. The headlights were a, were a real bugbear of mine. The headlights, to me, are the face of the car. Um, and if the headlights are cloudy, yellow, scratched, cracked, crazed, whatever, it just destroys the look of the rest of the car. So I appealed to Porsche Melbourne to help if they could. And they were brilliant. They spoke to Porsche Australia and they each decided to contribute to the cost of replacing those headlights. Now those headlights are about $4,800 fitted if you just go and buy them. But thanks to the generosity of uh, Porsche Australia and Porsche Melbourne, they were replaced for a total cost of two and a half thousand dollars. Now, two and a half thousand dollars is still a lot of money, but I've got brand new headlights now and they're genuine. So they should last for the rest of the life of the car. And now the whole car looks good. Now, final tip on saving money when it comes to servicing and maintaining your car uh, is to look at the service records up to date, up to the current date when you acquire the car. See which services have been done and in which order and what sequence and use that as the basis for determining what your next and subsequent services are. Don't just automatically accept whatever the dealership that you go to says is the next service because they may well say it's a major service when, in my case, for example, a major service was done not that long before I bought the vehicle. So it's actually not due, it wasn't due for a major service. It's next service after the one that it's getting in a few couple of weeks time, that will be its first major since I bought the car. But when I tried to book it in just recently, or not tried to, when I booked it in recently for its next service, it came up automatically showing that the next one due was a major, and it just wasn't. So if I look at all the things that I've saved money on with this car over the time that I've owned it, I have saved a grand total of $7,650. Now that's including the headlights. If I leave the headlights out of the equation, I've still saved $5,350. And that's nothing to sneeze at. Okay, now we're on to mods and some of the things that I've done to the car and some of the things that I plan to do still. One of the things that uh, I first didn't like about the car when I got it was how damaged the uh, cover was on the door pull on the driver's side. It was full of scratches and the little pad section that goes over the door pull couldn't be removed separately. It's part of the door pull. And so the solution I came up with was to buy another door pull on eBay, which I got very cheap, I think 150 bucks or something like that, and then send it to a motor trimmer and get it covered in leather, and then have that fitted by Porsche next time I was in there for a service, which is what I did. The door pull and the leather trim combined cost me about 400 Australian dollars, and Porsche Melbourne charged me $412 to fit it because of course the door card had to come off, and while they had the door card come off, I had them look for other things in there, like a couple of little rattles that were annoying me. I mentioned the iBark lowering springs earlier, that cost me a grand total of $1,570 fitted, not a good idea, I think. Uh, makes the car look great, the stance is perfect, but it comes at the expense of a harsher ride and additional rattles. I don't mind it being lower and having to be careful about entering and exiting driveways, that kind of stuff. I'm fine with that, but uh, I don't like the extra rattles and I don't like the way it's affected the ride. I knew that there was a risk of that, but because these lowering springs are made by iBark, I've had iBark suspension before in other cars and it's been fantastic. And because it's designed specifically for the 981, I thought it would be fine, but I don't think it is. I think you've got to go Olin's or KW, or just leave the car as it is, which is probably what I should have done. Okay, another one that I've done is an EVC throttle controller. This is a, a kind of a quirky little one. I didn't have any interest in throttle controllers until I drove my uh, brother-in-law's Mini Cooper S with a throttle controller on it and experimented with the different settings. <laughs> I couldn't believe how it altered the way the car reacted to throttle inputs. Doesn't make the car any more powerful. It's not a chip. It's nothing like that. It just alters the way the throttle pedal responds to inputs and you can make it a lot more aggressive. And it's 
quite fun actually. So I've set mine fairly conservatively. I think mine is sitting at four out of uh, nine and it does definitely make the car more responsive on the throttle. Because I found that when I first got the car, when I got out of my ND MX-5 and into the 981 Boxster, I noticed that this, the throttle pedal seemed to have a lot more travel before it would respond to input. Uh, likewise, the steering is just nowhere near as, um, as responsive to initial input as the MX-5. The MX-5 is just a darty little car, it's like a go-kart. Um, so putting that throttle controller on did enhance the way the throttle responds to input. Now it feels a lot more responsive. I just have to kiss the throttle and she's off. Okay, next one was the uh, the Zunsport grills all round. That cost me about $1,100. There's different packages. You can get front only, back only, side only, and so on. I end up getting all of it. Another item I put on the car, which I kind of regret, and I took off soon after was a, an ultra racing strut brace for the front, which only cost me $250. And it looks kind of nice, um, even though you don't actually see it because it's underneath the uh, cover where the battery is. There are a couple of issues with it. It made the car, and I know that's the job of a strut brace, it made the car even more rigid, but all it did was make the additional harshness of the ride caused by the iBike lowering springs worse. It also rubbed on the battery, which created a really annoying knocking noise, which I thought was a suspension noise and discovered it first on a drive down the Great Ocean Road. But when I had the suspension guys inspect it, they said, nah, this is what's happening. They put some foam between the battery and the strut brace that stopped the rattles, but that's not what I wanted. <clears throat> so I took it off. Maybe if I'd let the suspension stock, and then put that on, maybe that would have enhanced the responsiveness of the front end a little bit, I don't know. But certainly with the iBike lowering springs and the strut brace, nah, no good. On a track, maybe, not on the road. Not with bumps like we have in Australia and potholes. Okay, next thing was the steering wheel. Now the steering wheel is one of the best things I've done to the car. Uh, you can see it here. I love the steering wheel from Porsche Master and I've done um, a whole video on that, how to install it. It's a wonderful enhancement to the interior of the car because it's like renovating a house. All the things that you touch and that you use on a regular basis, light switches, window coverings, door handles, all this sort of stuff, you replace all those and it makes everything feel newer and fresher. And replacing the thing that you're always touching in the car, the steering wheel, with a nice modern 992 style steering wheel um, really enhances the look of the car. Now my existing wheel had was the multifunction wheel. So it had controls for uh, phone, audio, um, a few other bits and pieces, menu systems, that kind of stuff. Plus it had the, the uh, shift buttons on it for the PDK. This wheel also has all the same controls on it, including the shift paddles, and everything works straight out of the box. Just bolted it on, plugged it in, Bob's your uncle, everything worked. Brilliant, absolutely love that thing. Uh, and I've done a, like I said, I've done a whole video on that, so I'll leave a link down below for that. The rear LED light strip, that's another thing that really enhances the look of this car for very little money, and that was one of the very first things I got from Porsche Master over in uh, the US, and that transforms the look of the rear of the car. I love the long LED strip on the back of modern Porsches, and whilst this isn't the same, it echoes that same design language, allowing the tail lights to meet up with a continuous LED strip in the back that uh, is on when your headlights are on. I love it, looks awesome. And I've done a video on that as well, so I'll leave a link to that one down below too. Coming up, uh, the aluminum look fuel filler cap. Um, I left that at home, but I'm gonna slap that on. That looks really cool. Replacing the little center console bin, which is completely useless with a cup holder. GTS tail lights, that's coming up. I'm looking forward to seeing how they look. And also smoked LED side lamps, the indicator lamps, they're coming up as well. All of these are from Porsche Master. And William over at uh, Porsche Master has been brilliant. Obviously he's been very generous, allowing me to try these things on my car at no cost to me, but uh, I've already had a lot of feedback from viewers of this channel who've gone and bought uh, different bits and pieces from William at Porsche Master and they've been very happy. So I'm very happy to promote him and his products. I actually came to know him because I was going to buy products off him and he was uh, generous enough to say, no need to buy them if you're happy to do a video on them. If you like them, well then uh, you're welcome to have them for free. So anyway, total spend on mods so far has been out of my own money, about $4,000. Some of that was a bit of a waste particularly the iBike lowering springs, that was a bit of a waste, as was the strut brace. Now, if I'd 
paid for everything else, all the other stuff that I put on, which William has um, given me, then we'd be talking, instead of 4,000, about six and a half to $7,000. Okay, so what do I like about this car? Well, number one up there has got to be the driving experience. The car feels well and truly planted on the road. It's, it can be just as agile and as electric to drive as the MX-5. But the MX-5, of course, feels lighter. It feels more darty. It feels not so much skittish, but it certainly doesn't feel as planted as the Boxster. The Boxster just feels solid and planted on the road, and yet it's every bit as quick and agile as the MX-5. Obviously, I love the way it rides. I love the way it steers. Um, I, love, I love the way it sounds, of course. Everybody pretty much who has driven a flat six Porsche comments on the way they sound. They just have a beautiful, baleful sound when they rev out, especially if you have the one with the sports exhaust like I'm fortunate enough to have with this one. The acceleration, the braking, everything is just masterful in this car. The ride out of the factory is spot on. It's a perfect compromise between firmness, agility, and comfort. It's almost a Jekyll and Hyde. It can be a GT car, just like a 911, and be great for a long drive for a few hundred kilometers. And it can be driven in anger, in serious anger on a tight, twisty road and reward you with uh, fantastic feedback and a sense of real security and stability in the corners. I love the materials quality, the overall fit and finish of course. I've mentioned this in earlier videos of this car is it just has a sense of solidity about it that uh, Porsche is so well known for. Many other manufacturers, not all, but many other manufacturers just don't have. It doesn't feel like any corners were cut. It doesn't feel like anything was bought in from outside. It feels like everything was designed, built, engineered and assembled by Porsche. Something else I love about this car is the practicality, the space and the low NVH levels. As a, as a car to go on long drives, like I do up to my dad's place, three and a half hours away, it's the perfect car. You've got a boot in the front, a deep boot in the front. You've got a nice wide shallow boot in the back. You've got a bit of space behind the seats. You've got a proper size glove box to put stuff in. You've got two door bins in each door. It's a really practical car. This is like a family car compared to the MX-5 in terms of its practicality. And the NVH levels are a thing to consider too. A lot of people don't think about this when they get a sports car, but you're not always driving the thing in anger. You're not always tearing around a windy road in the thing. Most of the time you're in transit going from one place to the next, or you're just using it to go visit your mum, you know? So having a car that's noisy, that's thrashy, that has a lot of wind noise, tire noise, mirror noise, engine noise, all that sort of stuff, when you're just cruising on a freeway, it can be tiring. This thing is much quieter than the MX-5 when it comes to those kinds of things. It's a comfortable car to drive on long drives. And of course I love the looks. I like seeing the reflection in shop windows occasionally. It, uh, it brings a smile to my face and I don't think I'll ever tire of the looks. I've said before that the rear of it is not as attractive as the 911 and I maintain that the 911 rear end is just one of the most beautiful designs ever in a car. But it's growing on me probably because we've developed a bit of a relationship now after 18 months and so I feel a lot closer to this car now than I did in the beginning. And finally, another thing I love about this car is its rarity. It's only gonna become more and more rare, this car, over time. Even though something like 70% of all Porsche sports cars ever made are still on the road today, because the next Boxster and Cayman are gonna be EVs, this is one of the last of the petrol-powered flat six Porsche Boxsters. Yes, they reintroduced the flat six in the 718 series after an uproar, but you've got to pay serious money to get into the flat six models of that car. And like I said, with the next model coming out, that'll be the end of the petrol powered cars in the Boxster and Cayman range. So this is only going to become more and more desirable over time, and I'm going to continue to appreciate it more over time. Yes, I may well get rid of it, but that will be for another flat six Boxster or Cayman. Okay, now for the dislikes. One of the things I really don't like is the way the roof scuffs up. And I've seen this in all of them. It's a common thing. Um, let me show you. This is what I'm talking about here. This scuffing on the roof that occurs over time from putting the roof down in the closed position and then back up to the open position. You've got scuffs here, uh, here, and most notably, we've got them here. And that really bugs me, I don't like that. I mean, you can see it a lot more from this angle here. Don't like that at all. Unfortunately, there's no simple solution to it. You just have to put up with it until ultimately one day you've got to replace the whole damn roof. Other dislikes include the absence of CarPlay. It would be nice if there was a simple solution, simple solution, 
to add CarPlay to this, but sadly there isn't. You can either get a, a different head unit or you can modify the existing head unit by pulling it out, adding some stuff, some circuit boards and all that sort of stuff, and I'm just not interested in fiddling to that extent with this car. And I don't really feel like poning up a, a ton of money just to add CarPlay to the car. I can plug my phone into the car using the uh, USB connection inside the glove box. I can connect it via Bluetooth, but I don't get that nice CarPlay display on the screen and I don't get access to my uh, Apple or Google Maps or anything like that on the screen, which is a bit of a bugger, but I can live with that. Oh, another one, the wind deflector. The wind deflector that comes standard in this is a black mesh affair. Nicely made, all that kind of stuff. Looks good, but hard to see through, especially at night. The visibility out through the, between the back seats is terrible at night with that thing in. So one of the very first things I did was I bought a Perspex one off somebody on eBay. You can find them all over the place, eBay, Etsy. They're not that expensive. I can't remember how much it was, but they're not expensive. Uh, just a tip, incidentally, when you do put a Perspex one in there, you might find it rattles a little bit. I hate rattles in a car, absolutely hate them. And so I just got some uh, felt tape, which I bought in a roll, and I just cut it into strips, put it around the lower section and just the uh, sides of it and then push that in, rattle's gone. So yeah, that's my likes and dislikes. Okay, so for the big questions I guess, am I happy with my purchase and would I buy one again? And the answer is yes, I'm absolutely happy with this car. And I would, as I've already mentioned, buy one again, only I'd move up to the 718 uh, GTS 4 litre. Compared to my MX-5, which was a brilliant car, still love the MX-5, still miss it to this day. Uh, compared to that car, this one just ticks a few extra boxes for me. Yes, it's more expensive to buy. Yes, it's more expensive to service. And I guess there is that element of fear that some of my viewers have expressed about if something goes wrong, what's it gonna cost, all that kind of stuff. I get all that. But there are things that this car does that the MX-5 never could. For example, this car has way more luggage space than the MX-5 does, which is useful when you're traveling with your son on a weekend trip, a long way away, and you wanna bring stuff with you like camera gear, tripods, pillows, uh, clothing, all that kind of stuff. You know, They all need to go somewhere and having them stacked inside the cabin all over you is not really a comfortable way to travel. So having that big deep boot in the front and the wide one in the back means that we can bring all the stuff that we need and go on a nice long drive. So that is really important. The NVH levels I mentioned are much lower in this car than they are in the MX-5. So long drives are far less tiring in this car and you've got more elbow room. Everything feels a bit more spacious. It's just a more comfortable long distance car. And then of course you've got that beautiful flat six sound, which you can only get in a Porsche. You can't get that in anything else. You know, there are a few engines throughout history which are kind of the pinnacle in terms of the sound that they make. The original V6 in the Honda NSX was one of the best sounding V6 engines ever made. That VTEC variable valve timing engine, when it came on song onto the second cam lobe, just sounded extraordinary. And the flat six in these, especially with the sports exhaust, is just glorious. Likewise, a flat plane crank in the some of the Ferraris sound unbelievable. You know, the 355, one of the best sounding uh, engines ever in a car. So, you know, there are things that you get with this you just can't get anywhere else. But the big thing for me is something I alluded to earlier. I've wanted a Porsche and a Mercedes-Benz. I've wanted those two brands since I was a kid. Now I've owned 10 Mercedes-Benzes. I've had C-classes, E-classes, MLs, GL, CLK. I've had a bunch of Benzes. And for the most part, I've enjoyed them. Some things have pissed me off, but for the most part, they've been great. Um, but I've also always wanted a Porsche. And so this is the very beginning of the next chapter in my car ownership history. And I'm very happy to have begun it and very keen to see where it leads next. Okay, so the big question of course is, should you buy one yourself? Now, obviously I can't answer that for you, but I have made a few other videos that might well help you decide. I've made one about uh, how it fares compared to a modern 911, the 992 uh, Carrera S. I've made one uh, highlighting the opinions of viewers who own a Boxster and a, and a 911 or have owned both. And I've also made one about my journey upgrading from, in my opinion upgrading, from the MX-5 to the Boxster and why I did it and what the differences have been between the two cars. That goes into a lot more detail about that whole journey. So hopefully between this video and those videos, you're gonna be able to decide for yourself, is this the sports car that you should buy?